Good morning this morning. I think everyone likes personal stories. We're looking at a personal story in the Bible this morning. As you turn to Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, think of a personal story in the Bible. You remember the story of the miracle that Jesus performed on the boat with the disciples? He just got feeding the, he, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, and he went to the he went on the boat with he went on the boat with his disciples, and wind and the sea started roaring, and there were great fear among the disciples. And let's set the stage. The disciples had already witnessed several miracles by Jesus. Okay, they had witnessed these miracles, healing the blind, healing those that were sick. They they witnessed this, and so they had a firsthand account of miracles. But let me tell you something, they weren't really personal miracles to them personally until the scene on the boat. The wind and the waves were roaring, and they woke up, Jesus, why can you sleep? And if you remember the story, he calmed the wind and he calmed the seas. And in the Bible, do you remember what the disciples said? said, what man is this? that even the wind and the seas obey his voice. You see, at that time, they'd witnessed the, the, the miracles, but it wasn't a personal story. We can all relate to a personal story when we tell it, because why? We're in it, right? There's a personal story in the Bible that is sometimes missed around Easter time. And we're looking at that this morning. Luke chapter 24 Starting in verse 13, let me set the stage for you a little bit. This is after Jesus had already resurrected, okay? And if if I'm writing the script, Jesus is resurrected, He's going to tell a multitude that He's rose from the dead, that He's conquered death. But you see His encounters with people are kind of personal. Mary Magdalene, the scene at the, at the sepulcher, the scene at the gravesite, was kind of personal. It was just one-on-one. We see this other story on a road to Emmaus, chapter, uh, excuse me, verse 13 of chapter 24. Let me read a few verses and we'll discuss. And, and behold, two of them went that same way to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about threescore furlongs. And they talked together of these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself draws near and went with them. Get this. Behold, their eyes were holding that they did not recognize him. He said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one with another as ye walk and are... He noticed they were sad. I love finding humor in the scriptures. This is one that we could find some humor in these scriptures. Jesus comes to these guys. They're sad. They're walking. They're talking about the things of the last three days. Perhaps they were talking about the events of the crucifixion. But most importantly, they were talking about the recent events of the resurrection. The things that they had heard. It was the buzz of the town, if you will. And Jesus says, hey guys, what are you talking about? And Emmaus, one of them, one of them is, is mentioned. His name, his name there is as Cleopas, as we found in, in verse 18. And we see Cleopas is like, what rock are you living under? But that's my version. Let's see what the Bible has to say. Verse 18 and one of them who was named Cleopas answered and said to him, Art thou the only stranger in Jerusalem, and hath known these things which have come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? He wants to hear more. Here's the personal encounter. Here's the personal story that Cleopas and his friend are going to experience. And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, 
who was the prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Now notice how they had knowledge of Scripture. Okay, We see that in this next verse. They had knowledge of what was going on. They had knowledge of some Old Testament Scriptures because we see in verse 20, And how the chief priest and the rulers delivered him and condemned him to death and have crucified... Verse 21 is the key. But we had hoped that he had been the one, uh, that he who should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since all these things were done. They were looking for a political leader. They, were, they knew that a, salva- a Savior was coming. They thought they were going to have a political leader. They thought these Romans are out of our hair now. We are going to have a political leader who's going to bring us back to when things were with King David. You see, what they missed was the spiritual thing. And that's what we're discussing this morning. They missed a deep spiritual learning. Verse 22, they go on and said, And these women in our own company amazed us who were early in the sepulcher, who went early to the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had seen this vision of the angels who said they were, that he was alive. They're telling him all the accounts of things that have happened. And certain of those who were with us at the sepulcher and found it even as the women had said, but him they saw not. You see, they they thought Jesus was that political leader that they were looking for. They knew the story of the... They were going to have a Savior. They were just busting out the seams to tell the story that they knew. It was a personal encounter. And we see what Jesus is just letting them deal it all out. And He's getting ready to teach them a big, big lesson. A big... Let me use this key. A big spiritual lesson. And this morning I think we all can learn a spiritual lesson. Notice what Jesus says in verse 25. He kind of steps on their toes here. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? You see a stranger for the first time and if He calls you foolish... You probably don't want to get along with him, do you? First time they meet this man, they don't recognize it's Jesus. And he comes with this bold statement, Oh, you foolish man and slow of heart. You see, Jesus is always looking at the heart. He's looking at our hearts this morning. Where does your heart stand this morning? Jesus is looking at the heart. He was looking at the heart's of these men on the road because he saw they were missing it. They, they knew Scripture. Many in our church today know the Bible, but what about the heart? And you see this very, very important lesson that he's getting ready to teach them. He said, Ought not Christ have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? He reminded them of all the prophecy in the Old Testament how these things must happen in order to have a Redeemer, in order to have that Savior. He's like, you guys, you got your blinders on. I'm getting ready to pull them off here. Okay, That's what he was basically telling them. He began in verse 27. And he began to say, And these, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded upon them and in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He was reminding him of all the prophecy that was fulfilled, even that he would be raised on the third day. And they draw near into the village in which they went, and he went and made them, and would, and, and he would have gone far, farther. Verse 29, But they constrained him, saying, Hey, abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in and tarried with them. So you see, few verses earlier, their toes were stepped on because he called them foolish. He called them slow at heart. And he began to explain to them the scriptures. And they're like, okay, this guy might be okay. It's a long day. 
hey, let's, let's find out more about this individual. He didn't, have, he didn't have a clue what went on these last three days. So they invited him. You see the, you see the love of Jesus explaining things, and they invited him to, to tarry with them, and they eat. We find in verse 30, And it came to pass, as they sat eating with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. And I love verse 31. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And at that moment, he vanished out of their sight. Remember, the, the moment that they realize it's Jesus, and then he vanishes out of their sight. Uh, I can't imagine being one of these guys. You know, that, that they're, they're with, dining with Jesus, and they're overcome with emotions about the events of the last three days. And it's Jesus Himself that there you have this personal encounter. Verse 32, And as they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us while He talked to us about along the way and while He opened up to us the Scriptures? Notice that word that they use. Is it, Did our not... Did not our hearts burn within us? You remember just a few verses before, Jesus said, oh, you slow to heart. And now their hearts were burning. See, there's a, there's a difference when the Spirit becomes upon us. And we must recognize the Holy Spirit's work. We talk of the Holy Spirit, and Paul mentioned the Holy Spirit in, in Thessalon, uh, Thessalonians, and he mentioned this, quench not the Spirit. What does quench not the Spirit mean? You know what quench means? Quench means that you're suppressing. Most of the time, it was suppressing a, a fire, okay? Now, we look at these scriptures, and we see... We think of a fire, we think of, we think of Christ. He's that light within us, right? Let our light shine bright so other men can see. Don't hold the candle under a bushel, right? Let it all so others can see. We think of Christ as a light. Now, now think about a candle has a light, right? And if we were to quench a candle... Let's say we could blow a candle from three or four feet away. We celebrated a birthday at our house last night. 21 candles uh, on, on a cake. And if we try to blow that candle from a distance, the flame quickers. It may not be extinguished. Sometimes we quench the spirit and we give that little puff. If we quench it, we, we deny it. If we try to suppress God's work in our lives. I counted 23 young people up here a while ago. Praise the Lord. 23. We think of quenching a flame. Oh, we need to let that flame continue to burn. And when the Holy Spirit tugs on our heart to do something in the name of Christ for those 23, and including you guys probably... 93, you know, we think of the importance it is to train a child in the way it should go. We think of that, we think of the way that Spirit can lead us in our daily walk. You know, are we quenching it? God forbid us to quench the Spirit. But we have that flame within us, you know, praise be to God, we don't extinguish that flame. I'm guilty of quenching the Spirit. I'm here to tell you this morning. Do something that I was thinking I should do, but I failed. But the flame is still there, folks. The flame is not extinguished. If you know Christ, that flame lives within you. Yes, you could quench it. Yes, it could be on shaky, but it's still there. You know, when... When, when folks talk about the Holy Spirit, sometimes you get that weird look. If someone's not a Christian, you know, oh, the Holy Spirit within you, you get that kind of that look like, what are you talking about? And, and it is. It's okay to know the difference between something that's flesh, something that's spiritual. 
For example, this morning when you picked out your clothes, you probably didn't think spiritually, this is why I'm going to wear what I wear. Is that safe to say? But when God speaks to you in a way through a song, through the witness of seeing 23 children up here listening to the Word of God and hearing about sharing and hearing about giving, it brings a smile to your face. It brings the Holy Spirit within you to shine a little brighter. I think of attitudes and actions when I think about quenching the Spirit. What attitudes and actions are within you that's going to lead you? For example, our fleshly side, if we don't like someone, maybe tell them we don't like them because of these reasons. But if the Spirit lives within us, we're going to be maybe reluctant to that. But if the Spirit was in us, if it takes a bold stance to say, okay, this needs to be corrected. Holy Spirit, can you lead me in a way that I can show love and still get the point that this is wrong and you can make a stance in the name of Christ? What's the difference? Christ is giving you that discernment. The Holy Spirit is giving you that discernment to know when to speak up, make a bold stance, one to show love, and maybe even give another nickel, Brother Mike. We see the Holy Spirit tugging on our hearts so much in church, so much in the workplace, so much in our schools. Do we quench it? Do we try to blow it out? Or do we try to let it burn within us? You see these men, they said their hearts burned. And you see what they do next. Now remember, they just had a long walk with Jesus. They were tired. They wanted something to eat. They brought Jesus in. This event happened. And look what the next thing they did. Verse 33. And they rose up the same hour. They were tired, but they had to tell people. And they returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven gathered together. And those were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to us. They had to tell somebody. They were tired, perhaps, but this was a big event. Their hearts were burning within them. How about your heart this morning? Is it, is it burning? Or is it there? It's, it's, it's okay to, know not, uh, to not know the difference between the spiritual side of things and our fleshly side. Remember Nicodemus in the Bible? Educated man. Educated man within the Bible, the Scriptures. But he had a hard time distinguishing when Jesus says what is flesh is flesh and what is spirit is spirit. What are you talking about? It's okay not to know. Educated people don't know the difference between. But praise be to God, that flame is there. The Holy Spirit can live within us. The Holy Spirit can live within you. And my prayer is that it could burn with inside of you for attitude and actions. You see, it happened with these men. And what can it do also? It can be spontaneous. If we're not quenching the Spirit, when the Spirit moves, something could be spontaneous. You know, with the world of the telephone, the mobile phones, I've got one in my back pocket. I had a friend this week suffering from some cancer. He got some bad news that it's probably going to be terminal. So I texted him, you know, I'm thinking about you today, but brother. And it's okay for guys to tell guys that they love them. And, and I said, I love you, brother. I'm pulling for you. I'm praying God's will in your life. And I thought, well, probably he's sick. He probably won't respond. Hey, two minutes, he responded. Thank you, I really needed that today. And it blessed my heart to know that I didn't quench that spirit. The spirit told me to do something spontaneous, and it happened. Ever heard of a guy named W.A. Criswell? He was a pastor at First Baptist Church, Dallas. He got a seminary named after him. He used to, he used to pastor uh, down in Warren County back in the 1940s. But here's a guy with great... Doctorate of Divinity, and I had a pastor friend who was at a conference, 
in Dallas. This was some 25 years ago. And W.A. Criswell happened to be at the, Congress, uh, the conference by a change of events, the last minute thing. And here was a room full of Bible college students, some seminary students, some other professors at his, uh, his seminary. And W.A. Criswell happened to be there, and they said, oh, by, you know, last minute change, W.A. Criswell's here. We're going to recognize Mr. Criswell. And everybody's like, whoa, he's here? And they said, Brother Criswell, would you happen to come up and say something? It was, they asked him if he would speak right in front of everybody. On the spur of the moment, spontaneous. And uh, he was in his 80s at the time. pastor friend was telling me that he was there. And he looked around and Brother Criswell got up and he said people started getting their pen and paper. A new sheet. He's going to start taking notes. Because W.A. Criswell was going to speak. He's going to take down what he had to say to a room full of Bible students and seminary students. He must have had something very, very important to say to them. He said he took a minute because he was in his 80s, walked up to the podium. He got up and everybody had pen and paper ready. And W.A. Criswell sang a song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. And everybody just kind of put the paper down. And they said it didn't have the rock star voice or nothing like that. But he said it was the most spiritual moment of the whole conference. Something simple. Something spontaneous. Move the spirit in a way to influence the whole crowd. Sometimes spontaneous of following the Spirit can lead to big things. We think about the life of these men. We think about how they went out and, and took action. We think about high school graduation. We think about the future of those that are graduating. You know, uh, it, it dawned on me, uh, reflecting on the, the message this morning and, and how knowing the difference but when the Spirit is working and when it's not. We, we talked about the high school graduates. It, it dawned on me then. You know, it's kind of hard to tell someone, okay, raise your hand if you've graduated high school, walked, walked the line as they call it. Can you raise your hand? Most people, okay. You've experienced that. How do you explain that to someone that hasn't graduated? You know, you, you walk the line. I, I graduated. I put in the work, put the homework, or whatever it is. You went through the work. It, it's kind of hard to describe it, right? Until you experience it. My prayer is that you experience the Holy Spirit working in your life. And it's, and it's hard to tell you how it happens because it may be different for me than it is for you. But it's, it's spontaneous. And, and you think about graduation, you think about, it, it's, it's kind of like being a parent. You know, if you're telling someone, hey, you don't know what it's like until you have your own son or daughter. You know, they look at you like, okay, I have to experience it for myself. We think about the Holy Spirit in that same way. And my prayer is that the Holy Spirit will work. And it will work here this morning. You know, growing up, I grew up about three miles from here and close to the hospital. And at times, we would hear a helicopter fly over. And uh, my mom would usually say something like, Oh, me, Billy, I wonder who it is. Somebody's, somebody's hurt. Somebody's got to be taken. Did, did someone have a heart attack or something has happened, Billy? Daddy would say, Something like probably driving fast again or, or something like that. <clears throat> but it was, it was a heart for those that are hurting, you know. And, and now I live in Bowling Green, and it never amazes me, the helicopter fly over the house. Monday, I was working outside after work, and here come the Metaflac helicopter. And it amazes me because... 
I was so intrigued, I finally looked up on a map. And, and I think it's the Skyline. Have you ever heard of the Skyline Hospital in Nashville? If you draw a line from that one to Bowling Green's Medical Center, you, you come right in my path of the uh, neighborhood that I live in. So that's the path that, that a helicopter will fly. And can I tell you that there's kind of a spiritual moment when I see that helicopter fly over? Because you don't know the situation. Did someone have a car accident? Is someone suffering from a medical emergency? Most definitely, probably there is. But then my, my spirit, the spirit tugs on my heart. Was, it, was that someone that you didn't tell about Jesus? My heart burns within me that I need to do more then I need to do more to let my light shine bright so others can see. How about you this morning? Is that flame alive? Is that flame alive? You know, Jesus stepped on their toes a little bit, called them, called them foolish, men slow of heart. What's it going to take this morning? If you're still quenching the spirit, what's it going to take? Is it going to take a helicopter flight? Is it going to take someone in your life passing away that you forgot to tell that you love them? What about the spirit tugging on your heart to become a Christian? Maybe someone needs to hear it's time to give in. It's time. Where's your heart this morning? I'm going to pray in about 15 seconds, but as the piano player will come, if Chris, if you would come, I'm going to pause for about 15 seconds, and I'm just going to let the Spirit work. I'll close us in a prayer after this moment of silence, but I just pray that the Spirit could work, and you're reflecting on quenching the Holy Spirit. Keep in mind, that flame is as powerful in you as the power it took to raise Jesus from the grave. Can you remember that? Let's take a few minutes before I pray.